we are part of that army. And uh, I just want to, uh, I guess on, I think maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, I just heard the Lord say, remind them of what I'm doing. Remind them of what I'm doing. And um, he gave me three stories that I'm going to share with you uh, regarding us and what he's doing with us. Okay? So let's start out with um, Ezekiel 37. And all of these passages are pretty common. I've talked about them in the past, but they're pretty common passages of Scripture that I want to share with you. So Ezekiel 37, we can start in verse 1. It says, The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then, as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. There's a lot here that I would be tempted to talk about, but let me just share the few things that uh, I felt like the Lord specifically was speaking to us. And I do feel like this is a prophetic word for us, uh, a message that if we, can, if we can take and hold, we'll see things uh, sort of manifest in our lives. Uh, the, the first thing is, is it says that the, that the Lord took hold of him. The Lord took hold of him. The Lord took hold of him. And then it says, he was carried away by the Spirit. And here's what I felt like the Lord said, was saying to me for us, is that we have to give ourselves to the Lord. Wholly and completely. We, we have to fully Give ourselves to the Lord. The Lord took hold of me and the Spirit guided me. We have to give ourselves wholly and completely to the Lord. I said this before, um, a couple of Sundays ago, I think, and that is part of the reason why things are difficult and seem so difficult all the time is because we're not in alignment. Because when we're in alignment, even in the difficult things, we have the wind of God in our sails. 
and the wind of God in our sails takes the, the pressure and the relief from us trying to figure it out, trying to do it, trying to make it happen. Because with all of that comes our energy. And, and, and we expend this energy over and over and over again, and disappointment comes because we don't realize, you know, this is all in my strength. And, and I feel like what God is saying to us is get in alignment. Let me be the wind in your sails. And I think sometimes what happens is we, we may have five or six sails on our boat that God wants to get in, but we only give him one. And, and we try to work out the rest with our own strength and our own energy and our own effort. And, and we get worn out. And in, in being worn out, we get discouraged and disappointed. And God is saying, give yourself to me wholeheartedly, fully, and completely. The Lord took hold of me. And the Spirit carried him away. He wasn't fighting God in any way. He, he gave himself to the purposes of God. Life is so much better when we do that. I'm not suggesting that there won't be issues and circumstances and problems. But generally, life is so much better when we just give him our lives. When we say, okay, Lord, you can have it all. And the tendency is to just give him some stuff, and we keep some stuff, and then we just try to work it out. And I'm like, why? Why? Let's just give it all to him. And then in verse 2 it says, He led me all around among the bones. So the, so the Lord took hold of him, carried him, and led him. Took hold of him, carried him, and led him. And what you see is a willing individual giving himself completely to the purposes of God. God took hold of him. The Spirit carried him and the Spirit led him. And I think that's what God is wanting from us. That's, that's his desire, is that he wants to take hold of us. He wants to carry us where he wants to go. And he wants us to be led by the Holy Spirit. I, I believe that's the Christian life. And, and this this thing in us to want to do it our way and do it uh, on our terms and do it in the way we think it ought to be done, we got to resist that. We, 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 we actually have to rebuke that. Uh, remember the scripture when um, Peter came to the Lord and Jesus says, well, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to be raised to the dead. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, uh, no, 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 this will never happen to you. And, and the Lord said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because what he was speaking, what Peter was speaking to the Lord wasn't from God. It was from Satan. It says, get behind me, Satan, because you are only concerned about the things of man. Get behind me, Satan, because you are only concerned about the things of man. And let me just tell you, Satan is only concerned about the things of man and not the things of God. And, and oftentimes, there's this perplexity that, that, that happens in us. Because we want to be concerned about what we want to be concerned about. And God may not be concerned about those things. 
And if he's not concerned about them, I, I don't think we need to be. Right? You, you've heard the saying, it'll all come out in the wash. I, I think if, if we get in the will of God, there are some things that I believe we don't even have to pray about. We don't even have to be concerned about. It'll fix itself all in the wash. But we've got to give ourselves completely to God. Be carried away. Allowing him to take hold of us and to lead us. And God will fix it. The other thing that I think is important is what we see uh, in, in verse 7. It says, so I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then, as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then, skin formed to cover their bodies, but there was still no breath. And then he spoke the message about breath blowing the four winds, and the winds came and blew breath. So we see a process. It didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen all at once. I know we, we pray and we ask God to do certain things and we, we want him to do it all at once. But there is a process most of the time. All right, first, there were the bones coming together. Then the flesh and then the muscles, then the skin. Right? It didn't happen all instantly, all at once. There was a process. And in, the, and in giving ourselves completely to, the, to God, there is a process of him bringing us to a place of full restoration. For everything that he's calling us to be and everything that he's calling us to do, there is a process to it. It doesn't happen all in a day. I know, I know I wish it would, but it doesn't. And we've got to give ourselves to God's process. Listen, we, we know he's God. We know he can do it all at once. But he chooses not to. He chooses not to. And we have to be okay being in the process. And not, not becoming um, so impatient that we, we, we opt out of what God is trying to do with us. Because we, we forfeit everything that he is doing. And then these bones, these, these, these dry bones, became living beings. And I feel like God is saying, I'm bringing you to full and complete restoration. And then what's the last part? The last part of this says, a great army. That God is, 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 is building and developing and creating a great army. His great army. It's a process. You know, I, I, I spent time in the military. Tony spent time in the military. And listen, uh, boot camp wasn't a lot of fun. It wasn't a lot of fun. Because that's where all the training and the work is done. And depending on what... what um, branch of military service you went into, the weeks were different. Like right? some were eight, some were ten, some were twelve. Right? And you give yourself to that process. And what you look like in week one, you don't look like in week eight or ten or twelve, however many weeks there were. You look completely different. Not only are you you think differently you look differently. Your body is different. Your thinking is different. Everything about you is 
transformational. And I feel like that's what God is doing with us. But you know, one of the, one of the interesting things about that process in the military is that when you come in, they take away everything that identified you with you. Every, everything that, 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 that spoke of your identity, your clothes, your jewelry, they cut off all your hair. Everybody, everybody had to wear the same underwear. I, I couldn't have underwear from such and such a place, and so-and-so couldn't have underwear from such and such. It was all government-issued. And what, what they were trying to do, they're trying to say, who you were doesn't exist anymore. And I feel like this is what God is saying in these dry bones. Who you were doesn't exist anymore. I'm bringing you into a completely new restoration, a, a, a completely new being. I am forming. And it's a process. It, it takes time. Let's look at First Chronicles. Chapter 11, verse 10. These were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors. We're talking about an army. God is creating an army, He's building an army. These were the chiefs of David's mighty army. They, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's mighty warriors. Josh, Joshua being a Hakmonite, was chief of the officers. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Aoite, one of three mighty warriors. He was with David at Pasdamim when the Philistines gathered there for battle at a place where there was full of a field full of barley. The troops fled from the Philistines, but they took their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Three of the 30 chiefs came down to David to the rock of the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was at the stronghold, and the Philistines' garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from that well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well, near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this, he said. Should I drink the blood of these men who went at risk of their, of their lives? Because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Abishai, the brother of Joab, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed. And so he became as famous as the three. He was doubtedly honored above the three and became their commander, even though he was not included among them. Benaiah, son of Joiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzil, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down an Egyptian who was seven cubic. Seven cubic is seven and a half feet tall. Although the Egyptians had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. 
Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Joiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in great honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. And then it goes on, and then there's a list of all of these mighty warriors. What's interesting about this is that these are the kind of people that were part of David's army. David's army represented God's army on earth. It represented God's kingdom on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. These were the people that God, that, that David used to extend his kingdom. Mighty warriors for the purposes of extending the kingdom that David had that represented God's kingdom. And I believe that God is saying to us is this is who he's forming us to be. He's forming us to be these mighty warriors. This is who he's forming us to be. Here's what's interesting. We want a great victory, but we don't always want a great battle. See, we like the story of David and Goliath, but there was a whole army, the, 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 the Israelite army, that didn't go out to fight because they were afraid. And, and we love the fact that we can be the victors. But in order to be the victors, you got to have a battle. And some of the things that we're going through right now, God is testing us to see if we actually can be the men, the mighty men and women that he's called for his great army. He's, he's looking to see, can they be one of my great men and women of my army? Let's see how they do in battle. Let's see what they do in battle. Like Saul and the army kind of stood on the sideline while David went out and fought Goliath. These men here in this story, they were killing 300 men. One against 300. What are we doing with, and how are we handling the battles that we're in? Are, are we succeeding? Are we advancing? Are we moving forward? There is no great victory without a great battle. Just saying. No great victory without a great battle. And, and, and we have to have the heart and the stamina and the desire. There, there has to be a, a no retreat attitude in us. There is no turning back. There is no... Uh, jumping ship. There is no uh, let me get out of this as soon as I can attitude. It's just flat out, full on, going to war. That's what it is. That's what it is. 
And, and we have to be ready for it. We have to be ready for it. Let's look at First Chronicles 12, one chapter later. And just look at verse 1 and 2. It says, The following men joined David at Ziklag while he was hiding from Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who fought beside David in battle. All of them, did you see that? All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them were expert archers, and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand as well as their right. They were all relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. All of them were expert archers, and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand as well as their right. Here's what this says to me. That they were trained. They were trained. They gave themselves to the training. They gave themselves to be, to be equipped by God. To serve the purposes of God. They all could sling expertly. Right hand, left hand, didn't matter. They were all trained. They were all equipped. And the question is, do we want to be? Do, do we really want to serve in the army of God? Do we really want to be equipped for everything that God wants to do with us and through us? Do we want to give ourselves to the purposes of God in an extraordinary way? Will we Will we allow ourselves to be equipped? Or not? Will, will we half-heartedly give ourselves to the, to the purpose? You know, going back to basic training, there was always a group of guys who were trying to cut corners. You know, the drill sergeants would make us do push-ups. And, 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 and there were always some guys who didn't want to do the push-ups. Well, because they didn't want to do the push-ups, he made everybody else do more push-ups. We, we would have to run five, six, seven, eight miles. There were some guys who didn't want to run the miles, and they just walked. So the other people had to run more miles. All right. I believe that there are some Christians who feel like I can get away with just doing less. There's, 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 there's no need for me to do it all. And you know what? When battle time comes, it's the training that determines the outcome. Poor training, poor battle. They were all skilled in, in, in doing what God wanted them to do for this army. And they gave themselves to the training. And part of what happens with us on Sunday morning is training. The, the scripture says, and God gave some to be uh, apostles and, po and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists for the equipping 
of the saints. For works of service. So, so part of what happens on Sunday is your training. This is where you get trained so that God can use you for his works of service. And the question is, how well are you receiving the training? How well are you receiving the training? Look, there, there are some people who, who receive the training and, and they are ready to go. And then there are some people who just sit in training week after week, year after year, and, and still are no more equipped than they were when they came initially. But God is building an army. And it requires a degree of training that we have to be skilled to do what he's calling us to do. So that we can be these mighty men, so that we can extend his kingdom over the whole land. This is what he's after. He's after you being equipped, giving yourselves to him, being led by the Spirit so that he can use you in an extraordinary way to transform our world. Wherever you go, he's wanting you to transform that world. Here's the difference between someone that's been trained and someone who's not. There's many differences, but here's one. Someone who's been trained can look at the situation and say, this is what I'm going to do in this situation to change it. Someone who's not trained is going to look at the situation and complain about it. They're going, to, they're going to complain about it. They're not going to give themselves to it because they don't have what it takes to transform it. So what do they do? They just complain. But the ones that are trained recognizes that for such a time as this, I've been given to this purpose so that I can transform this situation. And we've got to be willing to give ourselves to situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in so that we become transformational people. The, the kingdom of God is, 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 is not ethereal, right? It is a practical manifestation of God's rule and reign in our lives and in the lives of of people around us and situations around us. When Jesus brought the kingdom of God into a situation, it changed the situation. It wasn't just a theory. It wasn't just a theory. It was transformational. And we have to be transformational kinds of people. And it requires us to give ourselves to what God is doing. And wants to do. This is what he's raising up. He's raising up an army. Let's skip down to verse 8. It says, Some brave and experienced warriors from the tribe of Gad also defected to, to David while he was at the stronghold in the wilderness. They were expert with both shield and spear, as fierce as lions and as swift as deer, on the mountains. Verse 22. These are the numbers of armed warriors who, Jane, who joined David. I'm sorry, 22. That was 23. Day after day, more men joined David until he had a great army like the army of God. 
Every day, more and more and more people joined David until he had a great army, an army like the army of God. This is what God is building. And we have to ask ourselves, do I want to be a warrior in the army of God? And if the answer to that question is yes, then we have to say, then I'm going to give myself to what God wants to do in me. Fully and completely. Fully and completely. Not half-heartedly. Not half-heartedly. Fully and completely. You, you don't become expert at anything by doing it half-heartedly. You got to give yourself to it fully and completely. Second Samuel. Start in verse. 15. Once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. Uh, let, me just, let me just stop there for a second. One of the things that you see, not only uh, with David, but Saul before him, and then even after uh, David years later, is that you saw this constant warring with the Philistines. Constant warring with the Philistines. Let me just say this to you. Satan never stops coming after us. Twenty four seven. He's got three things in mind. Kill, steal, and destroy. He never sleeps. He will use any opportunity he can to get at us. Constant. Sometimes more fierce than others. One thing after another. He's constantly after us. And we have to decide. Am I going to be in it? Or not? Once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel, and when David and his men ran, when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak. This is years after. This is David is, is close to dying at this point. David became weak and exhausted. Ishbi Binab was a descendant of the giant. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. He had cornered David and was about to kill him, but Abishai, son of Zerulah, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Then David's men declared, you are not going out to battle with us again. Why risk snuffing out the light of Israel? After this, there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob as they fought Sebekah from Hushia killed Saph, another descendant of the giants. During another battle at Gob, uh, El Elhanan, son of Jair from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, 
they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. But when they defied and taunted Israel, he killed, he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. These four Philistines were descendants of, giant, of the giants of Gath, but David and his warriors killed them. You remember when David was going out to fight Goliath, he took Saul's armor off, and it says that he went to a brook and found five smooth stones. Right? These five stones were for five giants. One for Goliath, and the four other stones, we believe, is for these four giants. One of them happened to be Goliath's brother. David didn't kill him, but someone else in the army killed him. Here's what's interesting. When you hang out with giant killers, you can become one. Because your perspective is giant killer. And I'm saying we've got some giant killers here. Your perspective has to be giant killer. It doesn't matter how big he is, doesn't matter how many fingers and toes he's got, he's going down. Did you hear me when I said, in another battle? The battles keep coming. The battles keep coming. We got to put fear aside and be like, look, I'm in it. I'm, I'm I'm in it. I might as well get trained to the best of my ability. I might as well give myself to serve the purposes of God and, and let him do in and through me and for me everything that he wants to do because I'm not retreating. This is, this is what God has called us to. So that whatever circumstances you find in your life, you have to know there's no retreat. You know, I think sometimes Satan just wants to see if we're going to lie down. If, 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 if he can punk us, then he'll just, he'll just punk us. He won't do anything. He'll just punk us. He's like. And if we retreat and run, then he's like, I serve my purpose. I don't even have to do anything to him. But if he knows there is no quit in us, and if he knows there's no retreat in us, yeah, this is, this is different. And he's got to be prepared to take a beating. He's got to be prepared to take a beating. And we got to be prepared to give one. God is raising up a mighty army. It's us. It's us. I did read, but in the Bible and the stories of battles, you'll see where one of David's mighty men was saying to another of David's mighty men, look, we've got this great army coming against us. If me and the, the part of the army that's fighting them are weakened, I need you to come and help. And likewise, if who you're fighting is stronger than you, I'll come and help you. Whatever the case, be strong in battle. And, and what the scripture says is that they both won. They didn't, they didn't need to help each other. They both won their battles. But they were prepared to go and help the others.
I don't know about you, but, you know, my personality, I, I think for who God's made me, I'm all in. I can't, I can't do half-hearted. Half-hearted will get you killed. I wasn't a big fighter growing up. I didn't, I didn't fight much. I got, kind of got along with everybody. But if I got in a fight, it was, it was death. I, I didn't care. Once I got in a fight, that, it was it. That was it. I'm sure I told you this story before, but there was this bully. They had bullies back in the day who would just bully me. And I, av- I tried to avoid him. I wasn't afraid of him. I just tried to avoid him. But you know when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired? I was in the alley of our house, and this bully was messing with me. I'm like, I'm done. I can't, I ran into the house. My mother was in the kitchen. She could look out the window and she could see. I came into the house and I got a knife. Just got in the drawer, got a knife, just as calm. Walked out of the house, went back to the alley with this guy, knocked him down and was on my way down. And she snatched the knife out of my hand. Don't mistake kindness for weakness. Here's what the Bible says. As gentle as a dove, but nasty as a serpent. God is calling us to be the people of God that he wants form a great army. There is no room for half-heartedness. You will get killed. Satan will snuff you out. And we have to decide. We, we just, it's a simple decision. I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in it for eternity. Not just the situation that I'm going through, but I'm in it for eternity. It doesn't matter about my circumstance that I'm in it. Right? Some of us are in it just because we have a circumstance and we want to get out of our circumstances. But as I said to you, look, the battles keep coming. You may get out of this circumstance, but there's another one coming around the corner. And so we just have to decide, are we in it? Are we going to be half-hearted? Let's stand.